because it's all about the remote end user experience benchmarking. And uh, well, it's a rare occasion that uh, Chris Griffin is here with me. Please stand up for <laughs> Because she is uh, the co-founder of uh, Rex Analytics, not the tool that we're using. It's still a community tool. So, and the original uh, idea came from the sessions that Sean Bass and I did like 10 years ago. We started doing that 10 years ago. And it was not because we had this wonderful idea to use video, screen videos to present ben benchmarking results. It was just by demand of uh, attendees we had at Rye Forum because we wanted to present some of the findings that we had at customers. And the problem was how to explain it with your, just by PowerPoint and uh, explaining it to people. Uh, and so attendees asked us to bring reference environments with us and show them the effects that we see at customers. And you all know you can't do that. You can br cannot bring your service and your entire reference environment to a, to a conference. So uh, we decided that we want to use screen recording. And, uh, and Sean had the, was the first who had the idea, hey, what if we put two of these screen recordings next to each other so that we're able to compare it? And he was using a flash player for that. And then we figured, oh, we're only using half the screen. How can we use more screen estate to demonstrate these results? And uh, he said to me, okay, you figure it out. So I found a way how to use, um, at the time, it was, um, what was it, Microsoft technology? Silverlight, Silverlight. So we were using a Silverlight player uh, to run these videos, uh, four, up to four videos at the same time. But then we figured, no, 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 four videos is too much. If you have two videos side by side, you can see stuff. But four videos for the human brain is too much. So we added the telemetry data. So that was the idea. And then Ruben joined this little uh, presenter, uh, presenter team. And since then, Ruben and I presented uh, the result at many of the, of the conferences. And this is how all the ideas uh, were created to produce a uh, community framework. So uh, uh, most of my time, I work at FS Logics. And then we have this team RGE, which is about remote graphics. Uh, the team remote graphics experts that was started by Ruben, so he is one of the founding members. And then, like I said, we started Rex Analytics to uh, have the intellectual property that we are uh, developing uh, in one company. So this is uh, what Rex Analytics stands for. And RDS Gurus, this is the sort of commercial uh, company. So if you want. Uh, us as a group to do uh, benchmarking, then it goes to RDS Guru. So it is a group of five MVPs and CTPs who just joined forces. And as a matter of fact, we have all of them here. So it's Chris, uh, it is Esther Bartle, and uh, it is Frank Berson, and it is Claudio Rodriguez and myself. So that is the first time that all RDS Gurus came together at one of those conferences. Hey, uh, we are all happy to be here at e 2 e So you've seen these videos. So I've done that uh, before we started, like as the warm-up. So you have the uh, uh, the links, and you have the screenshot so that you remember what I was talking about. And these were the things that really uh, inspired us. Um, so we were talking about that kind of, of videos very long before we started improving our, our framework. And we have these typical customer questions that we wanted to answer. Uh, and most of you have these questions and so far it's guesswork that we're doing. So if customer asks you, hey, do, I, do, you, do you recommend that I migrate from this version of a remoting solution to another version? Um, yeah, what's the answer that you give them in, in, in terms of performance? What is going to be the end user performance that I get when I do this migration? Today it's a lot of guesswork. Or you believe the vendor. And we found out when we did this testing, never believe the vendors. And uh, I've worked for, for vendors, and I can tell you, don't believe the marketing that is delivered by vendors. Because it's marketing, come on. It's not lying, but it's something between lying and the truth. Uh, because you want to you shine if you are a vendor. 
you will never tell customers or partners the not so good things about your uh, technology. You will always tell them how good you are. So this is why we decided we want to be independent and find out how things work. So performance impact, if you add, uh, if you bring stuff into the cloud, and if you have varying network conditions, if you have noisy neighbors, what happens to the GPU, uh, or what happens if you add a GPU to your environment, if you migrate, like I said, and what about future remoting protocols? Uh, Microsoft has asked us to do some benchmarking for them. Um, because they said, hey, we have a new implementation of our remoting protocol. Can you please find out how it compares to what we've done previously? Uh, and these are the kind of questions that we get from, from several partners out there. And uh, now, how do you measure that? And so we came up with this, okay, we can measure user interface response time. So how long does it take when you click on something until the response comes up? Uh, the refresh cycles, what graphics formats and media are supported? Uh, because part of the user experience is also a user clicks on an icon and is confronted with an error message because the graphics format is not supported by the remoting protocol. Well, RDP does that a lot, the old uh, flavor of RDP. So no OpenGL support, you only get error message. And also user experience. Um, so what happens to color depth and transparency? Uh, what kind of effects do we see when, uh, in, in, in terms of dropouts or blurriness or if we see artifacts like these squares showing up uh, when you uh, do heavy compression? Are the media, are they, are they in sync? Uh, called lip syncing. When people are talking and the audio is like three seconds delayed, this is not good. And uh, well, the user performance, the user experience that you see when you introduce uh, funny network conditions. And so this is why we built this Rex Analytics. And I told you it's still a community activity and we are uh, actively looking for input uh, from you as a community. And uh, you will also see that we uh, will give you access to the software if you sign up. So you can all use it for free if you want to and give us feedback uh, what you think about it and where you want to improve it. Long term, we'll need to charge money if you use it in real projects because we spent uh, a sig significant amount of money on developer resources. Our developers are in Hungary and uh, I mean, yes, uh, we get uh, better daily rates than we would get if we uh, had it developed in the US or in Germany. Uh, but it's still money that they're charging us and we're paying it from our own pocket right now and giving it back to the community. So we wanted to be protocol independent and no database and really focused on the user experience. So it's fundamentally different to what uh, Login VSI does, for example. So they're focusing on the back end, uh, the telemetry data in the infrastructure while we are rather looking at what the user experience is at the endpoint by using uh, little devices. Where is my bag? Oh, good. It's still here. Just to give you an impression what kind of uh, tools we are using. So all the crap here is right This is the smallest frame grabber we were able to find. It's an $80 device. So it's, it's cheaper as you would think it is. So this is what we use to connect a end device to a recorder PC. So we have recording software that we're using, and then you're using this piece of hardware, and you feed the video output into this piece of hardware like I do now, feed it into the TV. And instead of, well, presenting it, you feed it into a recorder PC with recording software, and you're able just to record whatever is happening on the screen of the client. And this supports full HD at 60 frames per second. So you get high definition, full quality video of what the end user is seeing. And this is exactly what we're using for our tests. So this is the sort of unique selling point of our testing methodology that we're using frame grabbers. So, and the mission is that I like it, uh, Chris came up with that, we want to de-suckify remote end user experience. Or if it sucks, we want to know. <laughs> All right, so we want you to look before you leave. Uh, we had an animation for that where the 
the guy was walking and everything looked nice and then you switch on the torch and you see, oh, <laughs> there's something bad and it's going to fall off the cliff. Uh, so this is basically what you do in some of the projects. You just believe the vendors that everything is going to be good. You implement it and customers are unhappy. So, and users are unhappy. That, that is what, what's happening. We want to prevent that. It's basically um, expectation management. So we're using a couple of elements of different technologies and uh, this is one of them, like uh, the frame grabber. Uh, that is something that is not the typical benchmarking equipment. And another tool that we're using is OBS Studio, that's the recorder. So uh, as a matter of fact, Ruben's son, Julian, he suggested that we use that. And it's a 17, at the time he was 17, and he's a gamer, and he said, hey, this is the typical tool that uh, gamers are using to record their screens when they're gaming you see there is an option to stream things you can either stop the recording or you can start streaming so if you search um, YouTube for these eSport uh, tournaments you will find many of these videos where the best gamers in the world are doing their thing and uh, you can watch it either online or you can watch it after the uh, after the tournaments and it's a huge business and like all the major football clubs here in Europe they start investing into that because it seems to be such a huge market that's attractive for them to make an investment into that. I think that even in Amsterdam here uh, that, that uh, uh, there is an investment into esports. Uh, so I know that, that several German uh, football clubs they're doing that and uh, so we're using some of their technology because o OBS Studio is freeware. So you can just download it for free. It's a very powerful software that produces the MP4s that we're using uh, to analyze. So what we do is we put an environment together and we have these shirts. And these shirts have these on the back. You see, we have this build, track, analyze. So these are the three steps that we're using. So we take the environment that you built with your remoting uh, solution for granted. We don't want to build it. So typically, you know how to build a Citrix, a VMware, an RDS environment, a, a environment or a Parallels environment. So what we do is, on top of that, we install so-called workloads and a couple of tools to control these workloads. So we want to put load uh, on the remote sessions. Then we are able to simulate primary users. So uh, that's the user we, we uh, have in focus and secondary users, that are the noisy neighbors. And here you see the link, dot, 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 rexanalytics.com. So if you want to get in touch with us, uh, you can send us either an email or check out the website. Uh, Chris invested in a tremendous amount of work to uh, make the uh, uh, website available for E2E so that we can see it there. So the next thing is we are using a component called Rex Tracker to control all the activities because the problem is that we're we're recording information, recording the screens on the client, and at the same time we're collecting telemetry data at a different place. So we have to synchronize these two things. Because in the end we want to analyze it and make sure that the videos and the collected telemetry data is in sync. Uh, so this is the, the, the toughest job that we have with that kind of benchmarking. So we have to build our own tools. Uh, basically an agent running here and a control service running here and an agent running here and then the control service triggers the agents to do the same thing. Uh, we can do it manually but that means pressing two keyboards at the same time. So this is how we learn how to do it. Ruben can tell you a story about that. <laughs> he complained about it every time that he had to do these things. And then we feed all the results into our video playout steroids. Uh, which allows us to show the videos and to uh, uh, visualize and to animate the telemetry data. Here are the workloads. We have these primary workloads. They're typically 45 to 90 seconds, representing all different kinds of graphics and multimedia formats. So we have 30, 35 of these uh, standard workloads. And uh, typically, depending on uh, yeah. Our, our mission for a certain project, we uh, select 10 or 12 of these workloads and run the tests with them on different, in different environments and different settings so that we're able to compare those. Uh, 
sometimes head to head, like Citrix versus uh, Microsoft, or so Blast versus RDP, RDP versus HDX. Uh, and uh, then we have the personas. Uh, these are the secondary users uh, producing, uh, well, the noisy neighbor workloads. And uh, they typically run for in total 60 minutes, 100 and uh, 20 minutes is the maximum. So during the noisy neighbors do their job, we can run the primary users and see how much uh, influence the noisy neighbors have on the primary user sessions. And then we feed it into uh, the Rex analyzer, which is this player they're going to show you in real life. So it's got four quadrants. And we can control what is displayed in the different quadrants, right? And we're using a tool that was developed here in uh, in the Netherlands. It's uh, Brad Wolf and Barry Schiffer, uh, who are the developers, uh, the creators of the remote desktop analyzer. So in many of our tests, we are running remote desktop analyzer as one of the apps, and we are recording the entire screen so that we have total control over what's going on because at the same time we are collecting telemetry data but then we can cross check does uh, uh, remote desktop analyzer show us the same like bandwidth and latency and everything that we expect and that we are collecting with our telemetry data so uh, that is something that we're doing in some of our tests okay and now we just simply ask a couple of those questions that we hear from the market and the results like, hey, CPU accelerated remoting. We compare between RDP, remote effects on one side, and then Teradici, PCRIP, or Citrix, HDX on the other side. And this was an early result, so you see we still did not have the real nicely injected telemetry data. Here we were recording the screen of our WAN emulator. And uh, that was an interesting thing, what we did, because we wanted to see, hey, we have RDP 10 here on Hyper-V with uh, discrete device assignment. So we have a, an M60, uh, NVIDIA M60 card in a <coughs> physical machine that we run in our uh, labs. And Ruben and I, we have identical servers. It's still R730s and we both have the M60, so we're able to run the same uh, test cases in both our labs, because sometimes you don't believe what you see. So it's always good if somebody can reproduce the result uh, in their own lab. And this is what I learned, uh, because uh, I'm a physicist, uh, educated physicist, and as a physicist you learn what it takes to do a proper experiment. If an experiment is not reproducible, the results are not valid. Very simple rule. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're able to uh, to reproduce it. And on the other side, the PC over IP, same settings in LAN. So what is the difference that we can expect between those two? So now you see the 4-up player. And uh, the nice thing is we can zoom into each of those. And you see here I'm zooming into the uh, RDP 10 and it consumes a certain amount of bandwidth and it's high up to 20 megabit per second but then you look on the other side wow it's more it's 30 uh, megabit so it uses substantially more bandwidth while the user experience is almost identical and this is important information for the IT Pro because the user said oh yeah absolutely all works well but then the price is that you have like 50% more bandwidth requirement uh, with PC over IP in this case. So that was one of the first things that we were able to find out. And uh, that was something that Microsoft wanted us to do because they wanted to know in which use cases can we recommend our customers to use PC over IP rather than RDP. And it turned out that the, uh, the sweet spot is if you have LAN scenario and video editing and high-end um, animations. So this is where, where PC over IP is really good, but it comes at the price of a very, very high bandwidth. It's even higher than, than RDP, as you have seen here. And RDP is not known for being, well, very low bandwidth. Uh, so 
what, where you use uh, PCOYP a lot is in Hollywood. So they outsource some of their video production to specialized service providers, and they uh, produce or they they provide all their applications to do the video editing through the uh, PCOYP protocol. So it's an absolutely valid service for such an environment where you have the film industry, the movie industry, and the service providers sitting next door. So it's a wonderful mo model if you sit very close to the to the, uh, the well the, the central hubs for uh, data centers like in Frankfurt, like in Amsterdam, uh, like in, in Dublin. Uh, these are the places where, for example, um, the Azure data centers are. And if you're close to those, then you can connect with low latency and with high bandwidth and can do that kind of scenarios. Now, we did a comparison of the uh, uh, Hyper-V M60 DDA again with uh, RDP on one side. So if you open it, you will see if we open it here, that remote of X. So uh, remote display analyzer shows us it's remote uh, effects using UDP and then on the other side we have uh, send desktop 715 and uh, we are using well thin wire so it's HDX basically and you're able to compare these two and we do it in a LAN scenario so uh, it's still on-prem and we want to take a look at what the difference is between those and what you see nicely here, the load on the CPU is pretty much the same at this stage with not much going on in the GPU. So what happens now is that the GPU kicks in here a little bit and then we start loading textures because it's a high-end graphics application. We are loading texture information into the VRAM, into the video RAM. And only if these textures are available, so it says loading, we really see how it's loading these uh, textures into the uh, VRAM. So let's just zoom into it so that you can see it nicely. Nothing happens on the network. <coughs> Not much was going on in the network. And now that we have all the textures in here and the real rendering starts, we want to see what is the difference between what Microsoft does and what Citrix does. And uh, what you can see here, the network consumption on the Microsoft side is significantly higher than it is on the Citrix side at the beginning. And then Microsoft learns about what's going on and suddenly they're reducing the amount of bandwidth they're using. So that is what we learned in some of the scenarios that it takes RDP about 10 seconds to adapt to network conditions or to general conditions. Here we have LAN. So it is not as much of a difference as we have expected. So the myth that HDX is always much better when it comes to network consumption is not always true for this particular use case. Yes, it's a little bit higher on the RDP side, not, but not as much as we expected. But the rest is almost the same, with one exception. You see the GPU stuff? Obviously, the implementation of collecting performance counters if you're using Citrix, if you're uh, running that in a, in a uh, desktop environment, um, it's like the, the mean value. It's not like the spikes. So it's like they're collecting the data and uh, they're producing the mean value over like 10 seconds. So you never see it spiking, you see the medium. While Microsoft, they give you the raw data, like what's happening. So you have less, it looks like you have less GPU consumption on the Citrix side than you have on the Microsoft side. But this seems to be the way how they implement the performance counters. Uh, we have not known that before, but we were able to reproduce it again and again. Uh, so that may explain some of the things that you see when you are using different uh, monitoring solutions and you're trying to compare uh, an RDP environment with, a, with, a, uh, with an HDX environment. So that was one of the things that we learned with uh, GPU Accelerator. Now we are adding network. Like I said, we want to find out if we add 
the network stuff to it. And network means not only bandwidth, but also latency and packet loss. And we learned that uh, latency is much more has more impact on the results than uh, bandwidth. And the reason is uh, basically it's uh, Mr. Einstein's fault because he found out that there's a speed of light, and uh, to uh, well send a light beam around the globe, if if you're able to do that to bend the light, then it takes 130 milliseconds. Uh, because we have the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second, and so we have the 40,000 kilometers uh, around the globe, so 130 milliseconds. But if we add a real medium to transport the, the data, well, the problem is that you're adding uh, a certain overhead. So it can be up to 50%, so you end up with 250 milliseconds if you uh, go around the globe. Plus, you have all the active components that add five milliseconds here and five milliseconds there. So this is why we see the 100 uh, milliseconds from Europe, from here in Amsterdam, to New York City, uh, which is another uh, hub in, on the East Coast. And if you go to the West Coast, it's even more, it's 130, 140 milliseconds that we see. If you go to Asia Pacific, if you go to Australia, it's up to 200 milliseconds. Well, if you go through China, you go through the uh, big Chinese uh, security firewall thingy, so it's up to one second. So you're losing a lot of, of uh, well, you're adding a lot of latency just because of the inspection of every packet that goes through the big Chinese wall. And uh, so this is what we have to keep into consideration. Now, we add the transmission, oh, I'm still some German in here. Um, if we add uh, <laughs> uh, the milliseconds of latency, and so the round trip time in milliseconds, you see that if you're using TCP, you cannot use all the bandwidth anymore because there's a handshake. And this handshake <coughs> prevents you from using all the bandwidth that's available. So if you connect your office that is 100 milliseconds away and uh, user experience sucks, and somebody says in the IT department, oh, we need more bandwidth to connect our subsidiary, it doesn't change anything. So this is a typical recommendation by some of the consultants. Oh, you just need to add, add bandwidth. Uh, you're constrained in bandwidth. No, no, it's not true. Uh, when you're using TCP, when you're using UDP, different story. This is why it's so important to open the UDP ports if you want to have good results. Now you start adding packet loss. Oh my God, you're down to almost zero. If you add like 0.1, 1%, 10% packet loss at 25 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, 150 milliseconds latency. So in the end, you go down to like one megabit per second, even though you have a gigabit line connection. So expensive thing, but it doesn't help you. Okay, now let's look at them, where we do it in reality. So this is our famous little OpenGL application that we're using, the Death Star in Lego. <laughs> so that's one of the, uh, one of the uh, workloads. Let's stop it here, take a look at it. Here we have, it's again the Hyper-V uh, thing, RDP, remote effects on land and over there. Two megabit per second, 200 milliseconds, 1% packet loss. So at the beginning, not much is happening because we are loading the model, selecting the Death Star, it loads. So you see what our workloads are doing. So it is scripted workloads using Auto IT. And, wow, well, nice rotation and zoom. But now you look what the user experience is on the other side. Wow, this is not what designers would want to have. And if you stop it here, you see, okay, it's using the CPU, it's using the GPU. The network, sure, it uses a lot more network bandwidth here for obvious reasons because we constrained it over here. Uh, and we are not using much of the video RAM. We have 8 gigabyte of video RAM. This model doesn't require too much uh, video RAM. But there's some other observation that we're able to make here. Look at that. We have CPU. 
And I expected it to be identical that the CPU consumption is the same no matter what the network bandwidth is. Because on the, on the center side, on the host, it's doing the same thing. But obviously, over here, we have less CPU consumption. Can we reproduce that? Is that possible to, to uh, well, reproduce it with another example? Okay, this is what we did next. We said, okay, let's go and take a quite simple OpenGL application and do the same thing and only watch the CPU. And here we are able to see two different things. So we are rendering OpenGL and it tells us it's 60 frames per second. Huh. And uh, the network condition is LAN on the left and 2 megabit 200 milliseconds on the right. So it tells us that it renders 60 frames per second. Yes, it does that on the sender. So if you collect the telemetry data on your uh, remote desktop session host, it's exactly what it tells you. It's 60 frames per second in the frame buffer. But obviously not all the frames make it to the client. So obviously the client software of the remoting solution, in this case uh, RDP client, is smart enough to report back to the server, hey, look, I can't handle this, so send me less data. Obviously, it does not get through to the amount of frames that are rendered in the frame buffer, but how many of these frames are taken from the frame buffer, encoded, and sent over to the client? Obviously, it reduces automatically the amount of frames that it sends over, so it reduces the CPU load. What do we learn? Add latency to your users, so the user experience sucks, which will reduce the load in your data center, so you can add more users to the same resources. <laughs> Most users will not like this uh, kind of optimization of your resources, but it gives you an impression how the load profiles on your servers may change based on if the users are connected through, uh, with high latency or in a LAN. So LAN uh, requires more resources. I didn't know that, and I had a long conversation with uh, Renko about it, and uh, we have all not expected that. So this is one of the findings uh, that we were able to gather. So, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. And here's another one, here's a, a pure video, and in this case it's PC over IP again, but we were adding bad network conditions, 8 megabit per second, 50 milliseconds. When I say bad network conditions, 8 megabit per user, you would not define it as bad network conditions. And 50 milliseconds, that is just across Europe. And, uh, but still, if you look at the results, you see that on the right side, the uh, performance of PC over IP is by far not as good as the pure RDP performance. So remote effects was performing much better than PC over IP. PC over IP was more accurate when it came to color. But if your video is stuttering, you don't care about the color anymore. <laughs> And, and these were the, the interesting findings. So as soon as you put it back in the LAN environment, performance and the, the perceived performance of PC over IP was better. Okay, so we have the use case. Use PC over IP for that particular use case and use RDP or RemoteFX for the other use case. Uh, unfortunately, Sean, I don't have a blast use case right now, so. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> Next time, yes, I will, I promise. <laughs> so that was, this thing with the network. And then we were trying to do that on uh, NV6 VMs. Uh, so the very expensive uh, GPU accelerated VM. So if you look down here, so it is uh, the cheapest one is $1, almost $1.50 per minute. Uh, no, per hour. And, uh, <laughs> it's, not, it's not so bad. But it's uh, more than $1,000 per month. 
So we were very careful not keeping those up and running all the time because we only had like $150 MVP budget that we wanted to use and we didn't want to burn it in uh, like one day. Uh, so we had to be very careful to uh, uh, shut it down when we were done with our tests because we were using the NV6 with, uh, well, it says it has SSDs but not really for the operating system. And this is what Ruben and I found out. We were wondering why the performance that we got with our own machines on-prem was so much better than from the machines that we well, were using in Azure because it was, on paper, it looked like the same machines, but it was not. They were using spindles for the OS. Marketing. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but the thing is, we wanted to compare uh, HDX with high uh, performance configured versus remote effects. And that was a very surprising result. And Ruben and I, we no, not Ruben, uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas Krampe and I, we presented that at uh, Synergy, and uh, Citrix was not amused. Uh, <laughs> because that was the good demo. <laughs> and we did not uh, show where they really suck. So we're using Cinebench to, to run those uh, tests. It's an OpenGL. Uh, benchmark and the thing was that remote effects was performing better and here you see this learning thing 10 seconds very high network consumption then they figure oh we're on a constraint network so we change it and suddenly they consume less network bandwidth than Citrix does and performance is better than Citrix oh my god how can that happen very simple we were using Netscaler in Azure, and that scaler in Azure, if you host it in Citrix Cloud, they don't open the UDP port. So we were talking to Citrix and Synergy, why in the world would you do that? Not opening the UDP port so that you have access to the fastest and best implementation of your protocol. Oh, the Netscaler uh, team that is responsible for Netscaler and Azure, they don't want to do that. Why? We don't know. We hear that feedback from our own field all the time. And Thomas and I we were kind of shocked because we were trying to configure it. We always look at a uh, um, remote desktop analyzer and it said to us TCP. While over there, it's UDP. So UDP beats TCP by far. And uh, Sean, this is the reason why you implemented BLAST with UDP right from the beginning, didn't you? <laughs> So, uh, and here we had the clear evidence that suddenly remote effects was performing better if we had this special constellation that Citrix is trying to promote all the time uh, using Citrix Cloud. Very interesting for us to learn. Another thing that we wanted to learn, hey, if we have the same application that's using DirectX or OpenGL, is there a difference in resource consumption because some of the uh, cat cam software you can select if you want to run it in OpenGL mode or in direct x mode alrighty so using another one of these high-end benchmarks unigen and here something interesting is happening because um, you see again it's loading the textures into the frame buffer so the user is sitting in front of the computer and waiting. And you see, wow, DirectX, much faster. Oh my god. And that was also reproducible. It takes longer if you're using OpenGL until you load everything into the frame buffer. After you've done that, performance and network consumption and everything is almost identical. So it also uses the DirectX engine when you're using OpenGL. So it does a mapping. But obviously the mapping comes at a cost at the beginning when loading the textures into the frame buffer. And that's also user experience. If your users have to wait like 10, 20, 30, 50 seconds longer until the application starts. This is a typical complaint that I hear from my customers. Hey, I want this, this time from double click to the application starts doing what it's supposed to be to be minimized. What can we do? And in this case, it was, okay, switch from uh, OpenGL mode to DirectX mode. Very interesting for us to find out. Uh, okay. 
So the final uh, test that I have is with noisy neighbors. And that was something that uh, Chris was uh, <laughs> working on for weeks, <laughs> nights, weekends. Six, eight weeks. Six, eight weeks. And it's condensed results because we wanted to, uh, Microsoft asked us before I joined FS Logix if this FS Logix stuff really works. Okay. So we disclosed that I'm going to join FS Logix and I said, okay, I'm going to write the uh, workloads that are required for that, but I'm not going to run the tests. So Chris ran all the tests. And uh, so that were the results. And we created like a video of the stuff that she was doing, like condensed into one video. So running everything in, uh, in Outlook with a user profile disk first. So what is the user experience when the user starts searching in, the, uh, in Outlook? So the user has only access to online mode in Office 365. And so when you start searching, it's going to take a while until the results show up. So you see it's empty at the beginning, then it starts showing some of the stuff after a while, I believe. Come on. Get the video stuff. Oh, here. So it's, and it starts, later it starts uh, adding some of the results that it finds. So it has it an attachment. <coughs> Now that, those were the cases where it did not show anything. Okay, and then that was also the thing that when I said sometimes it shows results and sometimes it doesn't. So you've seen uh, Chris recorded the five noisy neighbors. We had five noisy neighbors doing the same thing at the same time. So we had some of the users that didn't show any results and other users that showed the results. And we felt like people filming uh, animals, wild animals, like sitting there in the wilderness and trying to film those animals and finding out, oh, for some it works, the behavior is like that, and for others it's different. And this is what confirmed the reports that we heard from customers. Hey, a, a user called support and says, I have no search results. And then the admin tries to reproduce it and clicks on search and all the results are there. And the admin says, I cannot reproduce that. And here for the first time, when we had these noisy neighbors running side by side, eh, that was exactly what we were seeing. So three users, no results. Two users, they had results. And it was pretty random when that was happening. And, and, yeah, so that's the next one. And then it's a different pattern of which users found the results and which ones not. So now we have four that have no results. And this is where we realize that the secondary user is actually seeing what they're doing yes. as well matters. And then we were checking it while it was uh, filling with FS Logics, while it was filling the, uh, the search index. And so it gives us a, an error message, but you see that it's filling up more and more the search result while it is uh, doing the uh, user defined or the user specific search uh, support and now we have it completely indexed and rolled and uh, it's uh, really fast so that was the, the difference that we had and in the end what we did is we put fast forward we put um, <coughs> on-prem user profile disk with five noisy neighbor neighbors we put this on the left side, and we put the FS Logix on the right side, and we wanted to see what the performance is. But even more, we wanted to see the disk I.O. And for obvious reasons, there's no disk read if you use user profile disk because it's only online mode, while if you have FS Logix, you see the local read on the disk, what we expected. But this was the kind of results that we sent back to Microsoft so that they understand how the technology works. Like I said, this is a summary video of five, six, seven weeks of work, and uh, we just wanted to share that with you. Sometimes it is a lot of work to just put these little videos together. Good. Summary, remoting works increasingly well. That's what we find out. All the protocols are performing really well. They have their uh, pros and cons. If you compare them directly with each other, some of them have use cases where they work better, 
and sometimes the other protocol works better, so you need to know the use cases. That is the most important thing. There is no statement anymore, this is the best protocol. It doesn't work that way anymore. And we see uh, more and more managed service providers and uh, Office 365 uh, that are pushing uh, remoting like crazy. And like I said, the settings are uh, very often responsible for the good user experience, like do I have UDP or do I have TCP? That makes a huge difference. Uh, GPU uh, uh, acceleration is getting some uh, uh, real momentum right now. And uh, hey, we help you to do this uh, kind of uh, assessment. So, like I said, if you want to use it yourself, reach out to us. Uh, we need more people from the uh, from the community that actively contribute to it, and we are happy to have more people in Team RGE, which is completely non-profit, which is a community-driven thing, and we are using the Rex Analytics framework within uh, uh, Team RGE to do some of the testing. So, like I said, if you want to join, feel free to do that. Uh, good. This is what I had. Uh, I think I'm. Two minutes over, so yeah. I should stop. Maybe um, two more minutes. Oh, two more minutes! Uh, ah, two, two more minutes for questions. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I practice throwing. Please, questions from the end of the group. <laughs> Tim, have you any questions? No, you explained it all. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a challenge. Hey, man, no. uh, I just, I wonder um, from how many days we are talking when I. Invite you ah. to come to our place. Ah. We're talking mm. from six weeks or no. one day. That was ten days or no, no, no. the Microsoft thing was the maximum that we've ever done uh, because we had to build brand new workloads. We didn't have the workloads. That's not a standard workload. Um, so uh, if you use the standard workloads for us, typically if we want to run that, it takes us the time to build the reference environment on top of the reference environment, uh, installing our software. It's like an hour or so. And then running the tests. And the uh, results and the yeah. graphics and stuff. Okay. What we typically do is we collect everything and then we're on an airplane and put the stuff together on our computers and for the first time we see them uh, side by side. That's another couple of hours yeah. to put them together. So I would say it starts at two, three days and the sweet spot is around 10 days putting it everything, uh, all of it together. So. Uh, we are thinking about it when we have real projects taking the equivalent of two days of work, like the, the, the daily rates that you charge, the equivalent for two days for the framework, and uh, then add another couple of days to run those tests. Thanks. Um, this was this was GPU accelerated only. No, 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 absolutely not. No, there were there were. Um, do you test? Just software memories? Memory. Yes, we also do. <laughs> and uh, But that's a typical question that we then get. Hey, can you show us what the benefit really of a GPU is? This is why this were, these were selected questions that we answered. You can come up with any question. Like Microsoft came up with the question, hey, show us that the FSLogix uh, profile container or Office 365 container really works. We need the evidence, we need the proof. Because if we publish an article on our on our blog, as Microsoft, we need to make sure that it works. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Esther. Yeah, Benny, I do have uh, a couple of questions, uh, but I'll try to make it really short. Uh, first of all, I've been um, migrating basically uh, users that are heavily using Autodesk uh, and AutoCAD from their uh, local machines yes. to uh, Azure. Uh, uh, NV series. Uh, what I noticed is that it is hard to, when you're talking to the end user, to truly understand their perception of uh, what is a fluent performance. Um, yeah. So can yeah. your yeah. can you record basically their uh, end user experience yeah, that's, that's on what the I've done. machine? I've, I've done that for uh, a Swiss customer. Mm -hmm. I went there on site. I recorded how they use their physical high-end cat cam workstations because they wanted to migrate stuff to the cloud to a local cloud provider using the M60 uh, very low latency only like 10 milliseconds or something very uh, fiber uh, to the data center and to the workplace and yes it's exactly what we did so the baseline was what is the performance with the high-end workstation so that we know this is the best performance you will ever get and then we are trying to get close as close as possible to this performance using remoting. Uh, 
Uh, you already have one, but you can have one. <laughs> uh, Oh, and, and in addition to that, can I also basically record while I'm tweaking the, the cloud machine? You can always, like you can always record. For some of the customers that where we do not automate, the, sometimes we're using custom workloads, like mm -hmm. for the Microsoft use case, that was a custom workload. We put it together. That adds extra work. But sometimes we cannot automate it. So we write a script, yeah. and we have like users clicking through the workload themselves, and we record it in pretty much the same way, and we record and we collect the telemetry data in the same way. It may not be 100% synchronized the two activity paths, but it still gives you an impression of what the performance is on one side and what it is on the other side. Absolutely. And it will help me to, yes, yes, to yes. reproduce. You can do that. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I think that's all we're for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you.